Good evening and welcome to tonight's episode of Free Media, Free Minds, where we look at the free flow of information in our democracy and we also look at some of the obstacles and blockages in that flow of information. Tonight we're looking at the question of, of who owns our culture, who owns our media, the whole question of copyright. Now many of us at home have got uh, copies of movies, copies of media, copies of software that we didn't pay for and we know the great value of having copies of stuff and we know that it didn't cost much to make that copy in the first place. But there are some who say that that is private property and we're somehow breaking the law. So we're asking you, is making a, a copy of something, uh, should that be against the law? And you can SMS your answers to 074-103-6704. We'd love to hear from you. In the studio with me to discuss this issue, I have uh, Peter van Husden, who is a copyright abolition, abolitionist, and Tina Louise Smith from the Documentary Filmmakers Association. Welcome, guys. Uh, before we get into the discussion, we're going to have a look at a little YouTube clip that captures the issues on the table. Let's take a look. Here's a different trend. Yo! Soldier Boy, tell me. Hey, I got the new damn for y'all called a Soldier Boy. Just got a punch, then crank back three times from left to right. So this video inspired this one. You. Soldier Boy, tell me. Hey, I got the new damn for y'all called a Soldier Boy. You. Just got a punch, then crank back three times from left to right. Inspired this one. You. Soldier Boy, what's up? Hey, I got the new dance for y'all called a Soldier Boy. You just got a punch, then crank back three times from left to right. So the point is, these are conversations that's happening in this space. It's the modern equivalent of what Sousa spoke of when he spoke of the young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs, but not on the corner or in the back lawns, but in the presence of this platform that invites people from around the world to participate. It is showing us that Huxley was wrong. The atmosphere of passivity has been transformed. So, so much is not new. There is something that is new. Bizarre as this may seem, <clears throat> after hundreds of years of balance and respect for the creative process, there's been an explosion in a new approach by the law to these efforts and expressions of creativity. This is my favorite example. This is Holden. Holden's 13 months old. When his mother, Stephanie, saw Holden dancing, she grabbed her digital camera and captured it. And she then wanted her mother to see it, so she did what any mother of the 21st century does. She uploaded this to YouTube, Holden dancing. After a couple months, she got a notice that the copyright owners to that music had informed YouTube that the material infringed their copyrights and they demanded it be taken down. Now, where are we when serious people sitting around a serious conference table can look at this and think it's important to invoke the laws of our Congress to protect the extraordinary abuse of this mother sharing the celebration of her child with her mother? Or you all know this extraordinary photo, uh, poster has inspired a lawsuit uh, because the copyright owners of this photograph uh, that was ba this was based on demand payment for the right to build upon that in a way that celebrates this extraordinary politician. Well, we really see there some of the absurdity of what happens when we try to privatize information and try to make it static and profitable, uh, when in fact information just wants to be free. I mean, Peter, what is copyright and how did it come about? Well, um, copyright is one form of intellectual property, but copyright itself is basically a set of laws that determine under what circumstances and who can copy a particular creative production. So a book, uh, a piece of music, 
um, a film, for instance. Um, so it, it came about a few hundred years ago as a way to protect the rights of artists to market mm. their, uh, their own productions. In theory, artists, but we'll get a bit into more complications yeah. because copyright is something that can be bought and sold. So basically, an artistic product, somebody owns the copyright and that gets sold, and then that copyright rights holder has the right to yeah. market that image or that song or whatever it is for a certain period of time. And that period of time that that copyright exists for has been is steadily increasing in the world over the last several hundred years. Yeah. So the idea is that copyright is there to kind of incentivize and reward the person who does a creative act. Uh, Tina, as a, as a documentary filmmaker, w uh, what's the association's view of copyright? Surely it's uh, something you might support as creative people yourselves? Um, I think we would support it if we actually did receive some money from what that's been set up to do. But in our experience, I guess, as documentary filmmakers in South Africa, most of our income in the past has come from the SABC. And they have, they have that intellectual property ownership. So, so how that would work is they would commission a film from us. And even though mm. putting the, the content in that would come from what we thought and it would be our ideas, we don't own the rights yeah. to that content. So, Peter, it's not the artists that are benefiting. It's, it's how did that come to be? Who does benefit? Well, um, I'll give you an example, okay? I mean, firstly, I'd like to say um, happy birthday to my daughter, Edie, because she's turning nine today. Happy but, birthday, but, Edie. But, <laughs> um, but I, I, I won't uh, bring, get you into hot water by singing happy birthday on air. Because if I were to do so, you mm. could be sued for copyright infringement because uh, the tune, the, the song happy birthday is owned by Warner Media. Okay? And uh, it, the tune was originally a ditty that was composed for singing to preschool children, uh, a, a tune called Good Morning to You All, which then got turned into a song. And because of the current world intellectual property laws, uh, I can't sing it on air. In fact, uh, Warner Media is estimated to make about five thousand US dollars every day from the tune "Happy Birthday." Okay. You know, so so what we see is 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 large consortiums, which are basically corporations, mm -hmm. holding pools of um, copyrighted. Um, so so copyright content. is is meant to balance the rights of the public to have information and culture against the rights of creative people to have a, a livelihood and an income. But in fact, it's really been hijacked by, by big corporations. Well, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, you, uh, all of us, we, we don't produce for ourselves. We, uh, our production is hijacked. Our lives are hijacked in general by big corporations, and copyright is no different. Yeah. I mean, Tina, documentary filmmaking, when I think of documentaries, I think of that the is a lot of archive footage that you guys draw on to tell your stories. Mm. Surely then you have to pay copyright just to tell your stories. Yeah, I guess if we're using archive footage, we need to come up with a whole lot of money. So sometimes in the region of 70,000 Rand for 30 seconds worth of archive footage, depending on where you think you're going to distribute your film. So if I'm only going to show my film in South Africa, it may not be as much as 70,000 Rand per however many seconds. But if I think I want to show my film internationally, then someone like the SABC or ETV would charge me in the region of that amount to be able to access their footage and use it in my film. So, so you know, if I'm an, like a really independent documentary filmmaker and I have no money, and I'm just filming at the weekends when I'm not working at CTV. So, and I need that archive footage. I may be able to negotiate with them. Like, I can give you 1,000 Rand for this footage and I'll only show it in South Africa. But what if it's a really brilliant film and the issues are universal and I really want everyone else to see it. I just can't afford to get the film shown. So, so copyright really means that everything is then governed by the market, that you're going to have to pay to, to tell your story, even if you want to publish on a non-profit platform like Cape Town TV, or just put something up on a website. Yeah, that copyright is, is, is a large fence. It's, 
I mean, as you mentioned earlier, the, the cost of actually copying digital media is very close to zero. But copyright pools effectively keep a, a large amount of human creativity behind closed doors. And, and sometimes the result of this is that things are lost forever. I mean, there are many, many documentaries which uh, are simply inaccessible because the creators might have moved on to other things. They might not even be alive anymore. Uh, and the copyright is with a right holder who has no interest in distributing So, this so there's material. a lot of valuable culture and information out there that people have no access to just because we don't know who holds the copyright. Yes, there's, there's, there's tons of, of, and if you look at some of the, um, the old newsreels, the old um, uh, 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 you know, instruction materials which have been reused as parodies, as, as, as source material for other creative endeavors, simply because these things exist with no copy in the public domain, you yeah. see what potential there could be if uh, more was in the public domain. Yeah. And Tina, is there a, a, a risk where people actually with, use copyright to deny you the right to broadcast or use footage that you think is important? Is there that potential threat? Say that again? I don't... I mean, if, if I own some footage that mm. portrays the president in a particularly unpleasant light, yeah. You need to ask my permission before you use that footage in your documentary. Yeah. I mean, that is another way in which copyright can be used to I limit the free flow of information, Peter. Yes, but uh, I mean, while we're talking about this, I think that we need to also emphasize that, that for certain forms of media, copyright is effectively a dead letter. That the, what you mentioned earlier in terms of copying isn't something that's, hap that's happening at home, but with the aid of the internet, um, somewhere between... 20 and 30 percent of internet traffic worldwide is uh, so-called file sharing, most of which is uh, copyrighted yeah. works. Well, that's the so reality, of course. In our homes, we know that uh, although it's probably illegal for me to say it and I could get arrested, uh, many of us are involved in watching so-called illegal copies. Um, and we're going to take a short break now. When we come back from the break, we're going to look at what really is the good news, that the new technology allows us to access culture and information and then ask how can we support creative people to do their work if copyright is not the answer. We'll be back after this. At Cape Town TV, we reach thousands of passionate Cape Townians every day. We offer you affordable, low-cost advertising solutions. All of this at a price that works for you. If you want to increase your sales, improve your brand awareness, or advertise your event, then it's time to look at Cape Town TV. To find out more about advertising on Cape Town TV, please give us a call on 021-448-0448 or email us to sales at capetowntv.org. CTV News tells my story about my life in my own voice. Welcome back to Free Media, Free Minds. We're discussing uh, what some people call piracy, the illegal copying of films, DVDs, and media. Um, other people are asking, who are the real pirates? Are the pirates the ones that are privatizing our culture for profit? Uh, in the studio with me, I have Tina Louise Smith from the Documentary Filmmakers Association, and Peter Husden, who is a media activist and copyright abolitionist. Um, before the break, we were talking about how copyright really doesn't serve the interests of artists. It's been taken over by corporations to make profit. Do the corporations have the power to actually enforce copyright? Yes, the, the, the law gives, uh, and the law gives quite far-reaching powers to enforce co uh, copyright. So one of the things that was mentioned in the clip we watched earlier was a takedown notice. 
So under the American Digital Millennium Copyright Act, a copyright owner merely needs to assert that uh, a piece of media yeah. is in fact theirs and send uh, whoever is hosting it a takedown notice. And then what generally happens is that is then taken off air or off the internet. Yeah. No more questions asked because to challenge that is very legally costly. Now this has been used in the past to take down materials uh, which the people sending the notice don't in fact own. So copyright can really then be used as a form of censorship or flack. People asserting, I mean, Tina, is that something that when you're making a documentary, how careful do you have to be that you've got the rights to all the little uh, bits that you include in your film? Yeah, it depends on where, you, where you're planning to show your film. So if you know that you're going to show your, you're going to, you want to screen your film in North America, you know that those North American festivals and broadcasters, for example, are really fussy about you having the rights to, to do all of that, to show the footage that you've got, you've got permission for that. In, in South Africa, if you were going to show your film at a local film festival, those festivals aren't as insistent that you need, that you have that permission. So in a way, what you're saying is the system of copyright makes you think, well, encourages you not to go for the American market. Well, maybe, but, but not really, because, you know, in America, that's where the money is. You have a bigger market there. So you do want your film to yeah. be shown in the Northern Hemisphere in the first world. I mean, Peter, I, I, what, I'm, what I'm hearing is that there are lots of barriers to ordinary people taking the footage that is already out there on YouTube and using it to reinterpret it, to give their meaning and tell their stories. Yes, but I mean, look at the South African example. I mean, the um, Laugh It Off, the t-shirt company, had to go all the way to the Constitutional Court in order to make, uh, uh, to get the right to make a parody of the um, uh, black label design black, for the black, black label, label. Black label, yes. Yeah, the black label white coat t-shirt. And now, um, I mean, that, that uh, was incredibly costly battle. And uh, in the 1970s, there was a um, set of cartoons made as a parody of uh, Mickey Mouse uh, by a bunch who called themselves the Air Pirates. And uh, they were sued and they lost the court case. And so, uh, you know, you can try and use what's out there, but if you happen to step on the wrong side of what is sometimes a complex legal terrain, your work can either be now with things like the DMCA banned or you might be sued. And small independent filmmakers, big budgets for lawyers? No, we have no budgets for lawyers. So the system is, is really tilted in the favor of those that can... Who have the money. Yeah, and can make the legal threats. I mean, some, many people can't even afford to go to court. As Peter says, they'll just step back from the issue and surrender their freedom of expression or their right to know. Yeah. But you must look even beyond that because it's not just about having lawyers. I mean, it's also about who makes the laws. I mean, the current reigning copyright law in uh, the United States is the so-called Sonny Bono Copyright Act of 1998, which extended the uh, period of copyright by another 20 years. And it's mm. widely considered that the reason that this act was passed was because of uh, pressure from Disney Corporation that wanted to not lose uh, the image of Mickey Mouse. So Mickey Mouse was first made in 1928. Yeah. Um, and it was going to go out of copyright, so they wanted to yeah. uh, extend the period to the death of the author plus 70 years, which is what it is at the moment. Mm. So the corporations control the lawyers and the laws, from what I'm hearing, and use that to enforce their ability to make profit out of our culture and information. If, you, if you look at, you know, you, you know the film The Lion's Trail about um, Solomon... The, s the song, The Lion's Trail. Yeah, Night, yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, so, so he, he and his family never received any royalties from that song because they, don't, they are not a big company, you know, that could enforce that law. So now they're trying to get that money. Um, so I'm trying to say this very briefly, what he's just yeah. said, but there's a real example of, yes. of you know, that there was this of creative musician taking, taking ownership of that work, which wasn't theirs at all. Yeah. And the person who created that work just never saw anything. <coughs> and a South, a South African family now battling to get some kind to of benefit out of that work. And also, I mean, 
I was trying to say earlier, you know, like in, in hip hop music or in house music, in, in lots of music, there's, there are samples from compositions from 20, 30 years ago. And those musicians who created that music originally have never seen any money yeah. from that. Some of them have. But, but that music gets resampled and resampled and resampled. In a way, it's, it's almost perverse that we have to commodify and ask these questions about who should be getting what money for what. Surely we're talking about culture. Anything I produce, there's a saying that says there's no such thing as a new idea. Anything I produce is building and drawing on human culture and human knowledge. Yeah, there's, there's a little um, formalism that, that uh, uh, Negri and Hart use in their book Empire. They say that uh, exploitation is the expropriation of cooperation. Okay, so say big, that big words. slowly. For exploitation us. is the expropriation of cooperation. So as you're saying, we all work together. You know, we are, uh, are, if we're making a documentary, it is about people who are alive. If we are making music, we're drawing on inspiration. If we're writing, we're using the ideas that we've read somewhere else. And at a certain point, that cooperation that leads to uh, this new creativity is set in stone and turned into a product, into intellectual property. And, and that's why I call myself a, a, a copyright abolitionist, because I believe that you know, we need to abolish the system that does not benefit the vast majority of us. Yeah. That, that uh, you know, at a certain point, people, and those are the people with power in this society, declare that cooperation must stop and profit must start. And, and we all know, Tina, that new technology is making, is liberating information from the corporations and lawyers. What kind of alternatives are emerging? I mean, new distribution models, new financial models? Well, I mean, I, th I don't really think that new technology is liberating information because, um, because, because technology is still expensive. So while the middle classes and the upper classes are able to afford that technology. Um, it's really difficult for, for working class people and people who don't have employment to access that technology and actually get their voices heard. So, so I think, you know, there are different levels of, sure. of access. And I, I don't... But I've got in mind how easy... Mm. I mean, if you look at the Nigerian film industry, for example, how <coughs> a kind of... Uh, copyright-free distribution network has created a massively effective distribution network where, and we know on the Cape Flats and townships of Cape Town, people have quite easy access to all kinds of films and music that they wouldn't have if they had to actually pay the market price. Yes, but, but Mark, I mean, to what extent does this actually help you know, new, um, uh, new artists out there? Because you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to find a copy of, um, uh, uh, of the new Spider-Man. The new Spider-Man, for instance. Uh, could you please find me a copy of um, Dollars and White Pipes? You know, or the documentary on um, mm -hmm. the Bonneville uh, military wing. You know, so that, you know, there's, uh, because we have so this expectation that, that media must be marketed, instead of artists directly compensated, uh, certain forms of media which are already out there will be copied. But yeah. it doesn't necessarily help new artists um, to get sure. their stuff out there. So, I mean, there's a, a big argument that gets thrown in our face when we're told that it's illegal and we're criminals, is that the artists have to eat, they have to get paid. What are some alternative ways that we could imagine creative people earning a living if we didn't have copyright? I mean, Tina, how would filmmakers, how, what alternative ways are there to pay filmmakers? Well, I would like to think that the state would fund our projects because I believe that the work that we do contributes to society. Um, you know, gen generally, not, not in every case, but generally we are motivated to do work that yeah. stimulates society and makes people think... Um, and artists and intellectuals are performing a public service. Yeah. So uh, they could well be publicly funded and their product would then be free and freely and fairly distributed. Well, look, the, the, the thing is that, you know, the, um, 
big media giants are arguing that the, the ease with which um, things are copied is, is going to lead to a market failure where people can't sell their creative production, okay? And that's why we've seen, for instance, Disney and, and Warner going bankrupt, right? Yeah. Uh, or have they? So, but, uh, but so clearly, it's not leading to a market failure for them. But the market no. has de facto failed the creative people all along. That the majority of musicians so, or makers so, do so not get to copyright has failed the creatives, the artists, and the intellectuals. I think there is a technological shift that is creating a new environment full of opportunities and potential risks. I think this is a topic we're going to have to come back to again on free media, free minds. I want to thank my studio guests for, for joining us for this discussion. Um, uh, the show has been brought to you with the support of the Alternative Information Development Center and Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And we look forward to seeing you next week, Thursday. Until then, let's keep the information flowing. Good night.